Hello and welcome to part two of handout five. Here I'm just going to go over the second example uh, from the notes and this one highlights the pointing vector and its nature as the intensity of the electromagnetic wave. So let's take a look at the problem. So we've got the figure that shows a cylindrical resistor, like a wire, right? It has a length, right? So this particular section of wire we're interested in has a known length of 3.8 centimeters, a radius of 2.95 millimeters, and a resistivity of 1.59 times 10 to the negative eight ohm meters. It carries a current of 488 milliamps. We won't actually need those values until the very last step, um, but those are the particular numbers. So in part A, without any values, just kind of conceptually, we want to show that the pointing vector S at the surface of the resistor, so along the wire, is everywhere directed normal to the surface as shown, okay? So we wanna show that, that that pointing vector points radially inward, which would be you know, normal to the surface, okay? All right, so how are we gonna show that? Well, let's draw a little picture. So here I've just shown where the electric and magnetic fields are pointing, and this is based on previous knowledge, okay? Um, so we know that the electric field has to point parallel to the direction of the current, okay? So we're good there. And we know that for a current carrying wire, the magnetic field has to point um, in a direction defined by the right-hand rule. So if I hold my thumb downwards and I curl my fingers of my right hand, the curling finger direction will be that of the magnetic field. And so we see then the magnetic field would form a circle. So if we were to look at any that would be the field line. And if we were to look at the vectors that would compose a vector field encapsulated by that field line, they would all point in the tangential direction, right? Tangential because it's tangential to the circle, all right? So those are the directions prescribed by our knowledge of electric and magnetic fields, specifically for a current carrying wire, okay? All right, so if we consider a coordinate system with a tangential axis Okay, so what's my tangential axis? That's this T1, okay? A radial axis, that's the R1, and a length axis, L, okay? Then we can clearly see that the magnetic field points entirely in the tangential axis, okay? So if this was a typical three-dimensional three coordinate system, T would be Z, R would be X, and L would be Y, okay? But I've just renamed them to be evocative of the particular system that we're considering, okay? So then but we clearly see that B definitely points in the tangential direction. Right, okay. Meanwhile, the electric field entirely points in the negative L direction, okay? Which would be the negative Y direction in a typical 3D axis, right? So, good. Then we're going to use the definition of the pointing vector, which has to be equal to one over the permeability constant times the cross product of E and B, okay? All right, well, the constant just kind of stays in front, but now let's write our cross product out. Here I just wrote out the three by three determinant to just kind of remind me of where things are. So I clearly see that the E vector only has one component, the B vector only has one component, so the cross product should be pretty straightforward, All right? So I'm gonna go ahead and follow the rules of the cross product. I'll do this one first, so negative E times B, all right, looks good, and then minus, oh, zero times zero, okay? And then as I look at everything else, well, everything else is just gonna be zero, right? Minus this one times that one, well, that's gonna be zero. This one times this one, well, that's zero times zero. And then if I look at everything connected to the t-axis, I would have zero times zero and negative e times zero. So just a bunch more zeros. So the only thing that survives is this first term connected to the radial axis. And that's kind of the nature of the cross product. That's always what the right-hand rule tells us, right? If I have two, two vectors that are perpendicular to each other, then their cross product will be a third vector that's perpendicular to both. All right, well indeed it is, right? Because nothing was in the R direction, now something is in the R direction, and specifically it's in the negative R direction. So it points this way, all right? Well, that's radially inward, normal to the surface. Exactly what we wanted to show, okay? So there we have just a nice kind of confirmation, good visualization of what's happening with the pointing vector and the way it points. Uh -huh. See what I did there? Okay, so part B, the electric field has magnitude E equals V over L, okay? So we're gonna to need to consider the magnitudes of both the electric field and um, magnetic fields for part B. We're asked to, asked to show that the power um, that the, um, the pointing vector gives over the entire surface is exactly equal to the power that we would have got from Ohm's law, all right? Um, so are the so-called power laws that, you, that employ Ohm's law um, back when we first introduced circuits. Um, and so this definition here for the electric field, it, if it's unfamiliar, I totally understand, but this is just the kind of basic idea of the electric field, it's volts per meter. So if we want the electric field along a particular wire, it'd be volts, um, however many volts you're putting through that wire, divided by the length of the wire. 
and then we can use Ohm's law to replace volts with I, I times R, because we weren't given the voltage that runs the system, but we were given the current, and we were given the resistivity, which will allow us to calculate R based on the radius and length of the wire, okay? So this is just the electric field through the wire. Likewise, the magnetic field for a current carrying wire is given by this. Again, should be a familiar equation or one you can easily look up. All right, so this is the magnetic field, and it's just gonna be equal to the permeability times the current in the wire, and then divided by the two pi times the distance from the center of the wire. And since here we're interested in the magnetic field right at the surface, we have our distance be A, the actual di um, radius of the wire itself. Okay, so then we're just gonna use the magnitude of the pointing vector, which we know is just going to be EB divided by permeability. We're then gonna put in the magnitudes of both of our fields. Okay, so here's the leading um, one over permeability, one over mu naught. Then I insert the value for the electric field, which is just IR, IR over L. And then I insert the value of the magnetic field, which is mu naught times I over two pi A. Okay, cancel out the mu naughts right away. And it cleans up to be this expression here. Okay, so this right here is the intensity of the magnetic um, field at the surface of the wire. And intensity is joules per second per meter squared, or energy per time per area. Intensity is also power per area, right? So if intensity is power per area, if I want total power over the entire surface of the wire, then I'm going to, well, have to um, integrate the pointing vector over the entire surface of our cylinder here, okay? So what do I get? So then power is just the surface integral of s dot dA. It's not a closed surface, that's, that's why there's no, um, no little circle there. But we're just integrating the pointing vector over dA. But here's the thing, right? We know from our little right-hand rule confirmation up in part A that s always points normal to the surface. So that means that this surface vector, which is defined by the normal vector, that, it, that we just get simple um, multiplication. It's just s times a because they're parallel to each other. When we take the dot product, cosine of zero is one, right? So there we have s times a. Looks good, all right? Um, so then it's simply a matter of plugging in the magnitude of s, right? The intensity given by the pointing vector multiplied by the area. Well, the area of a cylinder is just the circumference times the length, so two pi a times l. Well, look, that just cancels out. And there we're left with just i squared times r. So that's exactly the power that we would have got in back in a cir the circuits chapter, where when, we, when I would ask you, you know, how much, how much power does this resistor dissipate? You know, in this case, the resistor being the wire itself. Well, you know, it's just I squared times R, right? It's also V squared over R for that matter. You know, these are, should be somewhat familiar formulas. But here's the interesting thing, right? Now we're really kind of seeing the confirmation of energy or the conservation of, the confirmation of the conservation of energy, because we're seeing that, that energy that is being dissipated from the wire, where, you know, where is that energy coming from? That energy is coming from the electromagnetic field, right? So we have, there's, there's just as much energy going into the wire via the electromagnetic field as there is that is getting converted to some other form, namely heat, and leaving the system, okay? So there's energy coming in via the pointing vector, via, via electromagnetic flux, and there's energy leaving in the form of heat, vibrating molecules, all right? So it's really this kind of, we're really kind of seeing like this explanation of where does the energy come from, you know? We're following, we're following the money, but in this case, we're following the physics, all right? And we're asked to get the number for that. Yeah, big green arrow, because it worked. And so if we just plug in our values, well, we got to convert R to resistivity times length over um, cross-sectional area. We have all those numbers. So then we plug in the current that we were given, make sure to square it because it's I squared, multiply by the resistivity, 1.59 times 10 to the negative eight ohm meters. Um, we got our length of 3.8 centimeters. And then we've got our cross-sectional area, which would be pi times R squared. And our R was 2.95 millimeters. So we got that times, you know, so 2.95 times 10 to the negative three, square it. And we get our final value of 5.26 times 10 to the negative six watts, all right? So that is both the power dissipated by the, by the wire in the form of heat and the power of electromagnetic flux into the wire. Okay, all right, so this was our kind of formal introduction or halfway formal introduction to the pointing vector, kind of seeing it in practice. Now let me briefly talk about the homework problems you're gonna be looking at that'll be due next week, all right.
So the first homework problem, problem one, is definitely the more difficult one, and it's quite similar to problem or to example two. So it's the same sort of idea, except instead of a wire, it's a, it's a conductor. So you're gonna find the direction of the pointing vector based on the directions of the magnetic and electric field. So use kind of the same idea, make sure to do the right hand rule um, or set up a cross product like I, like I did and then find the direction of the pointing vector. Then you're gonna use that direction of the pointing vector to find out how much energy is going into the system. But in order to do that, you have to do a little bit of um, work initially to find out um, how much kind of what is the rate of change of the electric field because the conductor, of course, doesn't have a constant um, current in it, right? It doesn't have a constant flow of, of electric. Electric field doesn't have a constantly changing magnetic field. And so, so, what we, so you're, you're asked for a particular snapshot in time. So you're gonna use the formulas of the exponential growth of charge building up on the plates and do that at t equals zero to find that maximum rate of change. And that maximum rate of change is gonna tell you how much energy is going into the pointing vector at the time that you first plug in the capacitor, which really is finally, is, you know, finally asked in, point, in part E, which is the last part. And this, this one, this actually, I'm gonna go ahead and change this now, because it forgot that this, yeah, there's E parts to it, okay? Because the final thing you're gonna do is actually find the numerical value of how much energy, how much power is going into the capacitor at the very beginning, at, that, at the point when it's charging at a maximum rate. Okay, so a lot of similarities to example two, but it has that extra step that you're that um, in terms of parts A, B, and C, I'd say are the extra steps. D and E are, are most similar to example two, and in A, B, and C, that's where you're going to have to kind of refer back to the exponential growth of charge building up a capacitor to make sure you understand those steps. Okay, um, so. Best of luck with that one. Um, of, of course, I'm just gonna grade you on completion of attempting the problem. It's okay if you don't get it on the first pass, um, consult my solution, which I'll be posting next week. Okay, um, problem two, however, is graciously much easier. It's kind of just a straightforward cross product problem. I give you an electric field and a magnetic field. I ask you to confirm that this particular electric, electric, electric field and magnetic field um, satisfy the criteria, how do I phrase it? So show that these fields describe the criteria for electromagnetic wave. So you gotta make sure that they actually form an electro electromagnetic wave. Well, what does that mean? I'll let you figure it out, right? But you just have to confirm something about them. Um, and then you're gonna find what is the power rate of, of this electromagnetic field, or first of all, part B, what is the pointing S vector for this field? So actually give that as, as a value, um, given an I hat, J hat, K hat notation. Um, and then part C, what is the power rate of this electromagnetic wave through a rectangular area that is one meter to the side and parallel to the XC plane? So there you're gonna take the dot product. Here it's, it's the dot product will not be the entire pointing vector because the pointing vector is not perpendicular to um, the XZ plane, but in fact comes in at an angle into the XZ plane, you will find. And so you just have to find the component that's perpendicular to that plane, and that will be your, well, your, your power, okay? Um, well, it's actually gonna be your intensity, and then, but then when you integrate that intensity over the area, you get power, all right? Units of watts. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Best